Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Janda. Welcome back to the Insider Insight Show. I'm honored to have with me someone who um, is an incredibly gifted individual who has impacted the lives of thousands of individuals and will impact your life in a very positive manner. It's Pastor Chris Casey. He's a pastor at the Adams Square Baptist Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. He is an author. Title of the book, Inmate 31749. He is um, many things, and he has in the past year become a freedom fighter of the highest order. I think that if we probably would have talked to him about a year or two ago and said, uh, Pastor Casey, uh, you're going to be seen as a freedom fighter of the highest order, and he'd probably shake his head and go, uh, well, no, I don't think so. But he has been, and he has gained uh, significant recognition in him standing up for the Constitution, for freedoms and in particular, religious liberty. It's my honor to have back have with me Pastor Chris Casey. Pastor Casey, welcome to the Insider Insight Show. Thank you, it's good to be here. So Pastor Casey, let's start with um, your journey from the prison cell to the pulpit. Educate our listeners on how you ended up in a prison cell and how you ended up in the pulpit. Yeah, I was a, a wild and out of control uh, juvenile. Uh, I went to a, a, a private Catholic high school uh, where I was searching for God. I just didn't know that I was searching for God. I asked a lot of provocative questions and was uh, uh, constantly told that I should shut up and sit down and, and not ask questions like that. Uh, and so that kind of deterred me from wanting to know more. Uh, so I had my daytime friends, but then uh, I also had my nighttime friends and my nighttime friends uh, ended up getting in a lot of trouble with me and I with them. Uh, I ended up going to prison at the age of uh, 19 years old. And one of my first cellmates said, uh, why don't you come to church with me? And I was like, well, if there's anybody in the world that you want to get religious advice from, it might as well be an inmate, right? <laughs> uh, so I was, I was very skeptical about this whole thing. But uh, the Lord knew what he was doing and uh, used this gentleman to bring me there. I went to church and I heard the gospel, I think, for the first time, and that was that Jesus loved me, and that he died for me, and then he forgave me of all my sins, and all I had to do was give my life to him. And I thought, it can't be this simple. I was, I was looking for this, this, you know, back in high school, and I, I never found this. And so to finally get it, it really clicked, and it made a lot of difference. And so my pastor uh, started to mentor me and disciple me, and he told me two very important things. He said, number one, you haven't disqualified yourself from being used in the ministry. He says, really pray about what God would have you to do the rest of your life. Well, you know, at 20 years old now, I, I didn't know what God would have for me to do, but I, I began to pray. With nothing but time on your hands, you can have a lot of time to pray. And then he said, another great advice is this. He says, you need to pray for a wife. Well, I looked around, and I was surrounded by a bunch of men, and clearly they weren't going to be my wife. <laughs> uh, so I had two years to pray for a wife as well. And so I ended up... Uh, giving my life to the Lord in prison and telling him I'll, I'll do, I lived my first 19 years uh, doing evil and wicked. I'll give you the rest of my life. However long it'll be, I'll give you the rest of my life. Uh, just provide for me the wife that you need me to have. Um, I got out of Bible college. I, I got out of prison in July of 2000 and, uh, thir 2003. Uh, two weeks after I got out of prison, I went to uh, a Bible camp where there was other college and career age kids. And I saw my wife, my future wife, uh, she was frolicking across the grass. <laughs> and I called my mom and I said, mom, I found my wife. And she said, that's nice. What's her name? And I was like, I don't know. I haven't met her yet. <laughs> and she's like, you're crazy. I said, no, I, this is the one. And she's like, okay. The next day I bumped into my wife, my future wife, Rachel, we started talking and uh, we never stopped. We've been happily married. Uh, we just celebrated 15 years. Uh, her dad was a pastor, and her dad, uh, you know, everything that her dad had told her to stay away from when she met me, <laughs> her dad said, give this guy a chance. He, he's, he's different, but he's on fire for the Lord. And so everything that her father preached about is the same thing he said, you can go give this guy a shot. He, he's, he's a good man. Uh, and so I was thankful for that, uh, that God not only gave me a second chance at life with salvation, but he gave me a second chance at uh, finding the best woman that I could ever have. Uh, so we dated for about two years, and I went to Bible college, graduated in four. I went back and worked with my father-in-law. He was a pastor. I worked with him for seven years. 
uh, fitting since my wife's name is Rachel, and so I had to work for Rachel for seven years. <laughs> uh, I'm thankful that I didn't get Leah, which is her sister. Uh, <laughs> that would have been very confusing. Uh, and so I, uh, shortly after working in for seven years, the Lord opened the door for me to come to Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, and now I've been pastoring for eight years here in the city, inner city. You know, Chris, you are very open about um, your past, as you already have yes, been today. Um, in your book, Inmate 31749, I imagine it has um, touched the lives of many thousands of young people because in the book you point out um, where you went, if you will, wrong, what, mm -hmm. what, what got you in prison. We have a number of folks that, that watch our videos and our presentations that are young, and we have a large number of people who are parents that worry about their children, obviously, getting into trouble. What do you tell the, the members of your parish that are young that you see headed in a wrong direction? What words of advice do you give them, and what words of advice do you give to parents who might see their children going in a direction that they're not happy with? Yeah, you know, with the whole... I, I've experienced a lot of greatness with the whole lockdown, uh, and, and that is this, that oftentimes kids and parents have been too busy to have to be a family. They've gone to this practice, they've gone to this meeting, they've gone to this, they've gone to that, and it really it's equalized everything. And so the advice that I give people is, is what you find in Psalm 1, and that is, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And so how are you going to teach the kids not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly if you as a parent are walking in the counsel of the ungodly. And so really, the, the, the epidemic that we have in America, in a sense, and around the world, is the fact that parents are no longer rearing up their children to follow and love God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all their mind. And because of that, you have a falling away of the, the juveniles in America because their parents don't love God with all their heart. You know, oftentimes I see that there's a, a, a casual Christianity or... or a complacent Christianity where people aren't all in for Jesus. Um, and so really it boils down to the basic fact that parents need to do a better job rearing their children. But also on the flip side, you know, we've got to make things uh, obtainable for children to understand and kids to understand and bring the gospel down to their level. And I'm thankful that Jesus was a master in that. He could talk to anybody. And in fact, when the disciples said, you know, don't let the children come to me, Jesus said, suffer these little children to come unto me and said, you know, bring them. Let me instruct them. Let me teach them. And so really our goal should be to go after uh, our children and teach them the ways of the Lord and, and show them how to make right decisions and help them make right decisions so they don't make bad decisions like I ended up making going to prison. When you were in prison, your first night, what was it like? Uh, I was locked in a cell. Uh, a single cell by myself for the first night, um, and it was it was a, a unique experience. I, at that at that moment, I had no idea what my future uh, was in front of me. Uh, I just knew that I had uh, two years to go, you know. And so it, it began to be one day at a time, uh, one moment at a time. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, because of the. Uh, the state that I committed a crime in New Hampshire is one of the least violent prisons uh, in America, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, but that doesn't negate the fact that it was still an extremely tough time. Um, so I begin one moment at a time, just trying to find myself, what happened, where did I go wrong? Uh, and then obviously that led me into uh, the church and, and led me to where God wanted me to be. Best day in prison, worst day, excuse me, worst day in prison. Uh, when my grandmother died and I wasn't able to get out and, and, and go to the funeral, um, I think that, that was tough. Uh, you know, there's some other tough times and that was, you know, before I went to prison, I was a state championship football player, uh, MVP, had a lot of fun, you know, fast money, fast cars, fast girls, fast alcohol, fast drugs. And all of my friends the night before said, Hey, we're going to come visit you. We're going to write you. We're going to call, <laughs> um, yeah. and you know, three, six months in. There was nobody there. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord, uh, you know, I, I was popular in high school. And within six months, he stripped the care of being popular. 
you know, I, I no longer counted the days. I began to count the Friday nights because I knew my friends were going to be having fun and I wasn't there having fun. And so when the Lord strips something from you, like your care being popular, uh, he always fills it with something else. And that was his presence. And so he took something that as a young person, we all strive for. And he gave me something different. And that was his presence that he was never going to leave me nor forsake me. And that began the journey of, of walking with him and talking with him on a more faithful and regular basis. And still today, I'm thankful for that presence because, the, you know, there's been I, I stood up against the governor and there was a lot of my friends, pastor friends who turned their back on me, mm -hmm. uh, who called me and said, uh, you know, this is not the way God would have it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, I, I respect I, I, I respect you, but I, I disagree. Uh, this is what the Lord put on my heart. And uh, and by the way, you're th you're welcome because churches are open because I took a stand. So, you know, have a nice day. Uh, and I, and I, I say that humbly, but, you know, when you're out front doing something that nobody else is doing, you're going to take, you have friendly fire and then you have, uh, you have enemy fire. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the presence of God, no harm is going to, you know, come to you. You know, no weapon formed against you shall, shall prosper. An important person in your life was Pastor Hoyt. Yes. Educate our listeners on Pastor Hoyt and his impact on your life. Yeah, you know, Pastor Hoy was a, is a great man. I, I love him very, very dearly. Um, he he had a thriving ministry uh, out west, uh, a thriving kid ministry working for his pastor. Uh, and he went to his pastor one day and he said, Pastor, I feel like God's calling me away. He's calling me to New Hampshire, uh, to this really small town in New Hampshire. And his pastor looked at him and said, you know, you got to be crazy. You know, you, you have this ministry. You don't need to leave. Uh, and then he came back to his pastor a couple of days later, and he said, Pastor, I really feel like I need to leave. And his pastor again said, you know, don't leave. You have so much going on here. And he came back a third time, and he was crying. And he said, Pastor, God is telling me I have to leave. I have to go to this town. I have to start a church here. And so his pastor said, okay, if God's telling you that desperately and that, you know, forcefully, you got to go. So he moved his family across the country and went to this small little town up in Berlin, New Hampshire. Uh, about a year after he got there, the New Hampshire State Prison opened. And what did he do? He became the chaplain in the prison. Uh, and shortly after the prison opened, I went to this brand new prison, and that's where I met Pastor Hoyt. Hmm. Um, and that's when he showed me the gospel for the first time and, and led me to Jesus. And upon doing that, you know, I, it was something that I longed for, it was something that I, I, my soul was thirsty for. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for the two years that he spent, you know, three or four times a week discipling me, training me, uh, helping me listen to sermons, uh, getting me involved in the things as best as he could uh, with to begin my walk with the Lord. And then I'm thankful because instead of, uh, you know, when I got released, instead of just letting me go back into the world, he called up a church in my town and said, hey, you need to go get this guy. And so this church didn't know who I was, but yet they came and they picked up this convict and brought him to church. And, uh, <laughs> You know, and they had all eyes on me, but, you know, I, I was thankful because uh, that's what I was looking for. Uh, and then two weeks later, I ended up, you know, meeting my wife. And so the Lord really has used him in a, in a mighty way. And I'm thankful because um, right now sitting on the governor's desk in the state of New Hampshire is my pardon request, my pardon application. Uh, and I'm waiting to hear back. We were supposed to hear back back in February, March. But because of everything mm -hmm. with COVID, it put everything to a standstill. You know, when Pastor Hoyt made this comment, he said, I have seen thousands of inmates come through in the last uh, 20 years, and there's not one that I would write a pardon request for besides Chris Casey. And you know, that was humbling words. That you've, seen a th you've seen a thousand people, thousands of people, and there's only one that you're willing to you know, write a request for. And so I was humbled by that mm -hmm. and, and, and gracious for that because it had a very, big, a very, very big impact in my life. If Pastor Hoyt hadn't come into your life, if the other inmate hadn't suggested that you go to a service, where do you think you would have ended up, Chris? I, I probably ended up right back in the world, a whole lot smarter and committing the same amount of crimes, just not getting caught. Um, you know, that's that's our sinful nature. Uh, it, it's often uh, a cliche that people go to prison to get smarter mm -hmm. uh, and to get refined because they learn how other people got caught and they learn new schemes and they learn new tactics and then they go out and try it and sometimes they get caught and most of the time they don't because uh they perfected their craft and so i'm thankful that you know god broke that in my life 
you know, I, I could have got a slap on the wrist. I could have got, you know, I, I could have got probation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Lord saw fit to allow me to go to prison for two years. Um, and I find great comfort in Joseph. Joseph mm, went to prison yeah. for two years. Mm-hmm. He was innocent, uh, but he went to prison for two years. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of found, and then I looked at his life and I said, you know, he went to prison, but yet God was with him. And, uh, and his hand was upon him, and God did great things. And so if God could do that for Joseph, who was innocent, what could God do for me, who was guilty? Um, and so I'm thankful that uh, Pastor Hoyt was there. Chris, when you look about what's happening in our country right now, um, Seattle, Chicago, Portland, you see Antifa, you see um, the organizers, if you will, the founders of Black Lives Matter, who have declared themselves as being Marxist terrorists, you see the death and destruction and the rioting and the looting. Chris, what's the best way to deal with folks that are in those organizations from your perspective? So listen, I, I pastor an inner city church. Uh, I'm thankful for that. I, 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 don't, I don't look at people uh, by, by the color of their skin. I try mm-hmm. to always remember Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s phrase, uh, I want my kids to grow up in a world where they're judged by the the content of the character and not the color of their skin. And that's how I look at people because mm-hmm. uh, realistically we came from Adam and Eve and therefore we have the same Adamic race. We come from God. And so I don't look at people in, in a negative way. Uh, I try to look at everybody that God has a plan for them and God wants to redeem them. Uh, right now in my church, I'm personally facing, I've been called a racist because I have preached on the Marxist and socialistic and communist and terroristic ideas of Black Lives Matter organization. Mm-hmm. Um, because what they want to do is overthrow what somebody was born with. And that's uh, if they were born a man, no, you can be a woman. Uh, they, they want to push the whole homosexual agenda. Uh, their literal makeup says they want to break up the Western nuclear family. Uh, and, and back in June 19th, the, the co-founder of uh, of Black Lives Matter came out and said her whole goal was to bring Marxism into America and overthrow Donald Trump because he's a wicked man. Uh, What's the problem with that is that everybody matters to God. And Mm -hmm. the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so whosoever means everybody. Um, But we have a great problem in America where it used to be many years ago people had forgotten God. And now we're coming to a place in America where people don't even know God. You know, people think that Easter Sunday is about, you know, an Easter bunny. People <laughs> think that Christmas is about Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. And what's what's wrong with that? People have, have lost the understanding of who Jesus Christ is and why he was born and what he came into the world for. And so when we, we remove God from, you know, from schools and prayer in 1962, and then a couple years later we started putting police in the schools, now there's a movement to defund the police. Well, it only took, it only took you know, 50, 60 years to, to have, have this happen. You're seeing two or three generations in that time be removed from God and be removed from the authority that's over them. You know, I have people tell me all the time when they were a little kid, if they did wrong in school, you know, their mom and dad would find out and they'd, they'd mm. get disciplined at school and they'd get disciplined when they got home. Yeah, guilty. And, yeah. now, <laughs> and now it's reversed. Right. Now it's you did something wrong. It was a teacher's fault. And little, little Johnny or Susie is okay. And so you really have an upending of the authority in, in, in America. And so when you have people who don't care about where we came from, and they don't care about the, the foundation in which America was created, and that was that we would have the liberty to have different differences, the liberty to have the freedom of discussion. Uh, you know, I was labeled a racist because I stood up for the cause of Jesus Christ, and I, bla- I basically said, look, you either choose the Bible and Jesus, or you're choosing a socialistic organization over God. It's your choice. Um, but that's part of their playbook. Because you don't agree with them, they're told to label you as something. Mm-hmm. And that's the frustrating thing is that you can't have dialogue with someone who wants to kill you. You can't have dialogue with someone who, who literally wants to overthrow everything that you are. And so, again, it goes back to the, it goes back to the parents. You know, the Bible says if we spare the rod, we destroy the child. And we've seen a whole generation or two three generations of parents who didn't who haven't disciplined their kids their kids have a meltdown in the store because they don't get a candy bar you know back when i was a kid if i got a meltdown in the store because i didn't get a candy bar yeah, look, I, i'd get a whooping when i got yeah. home but <laughs> right. now it's a now it's a completely different thing there's a meltdown oh it's okay it's okay 
and if uh, there's no there's no change in action, and therefore they grow up thinking that this is okay, and so it shouldn't be surprising that there's turmoil in America, for the for the lack that people are are, are don't understand who Jesus is and what He has done for us. Chris, educate our listeners on and viewers on your parish bef- before the coronavirus hit, uh, uh, COVID-19. How many people were in your parish, the consistency, the, the demographics, uh, um, how your parish was networked in the community? Sure, we had, we had a very diverse network, uh, and it was amazing. We had between 75 and 125 that would regularly attend. Uh, most of them uh, would be uh, transported in via public transportation or our bus ministry. Uh, and then a good 40% of them would come their own way, um, and so you have a lot. You have it's very diverse. People from all over, uh, all over the world. It, any given Sunday, you can see me and my wife and our, you know, our, our leadership team in the church walk around with Google Translate, uh, trying to talk to people uh, and, and getting to know who they are and what they're all about. And so I'm thankful for that. Uh, we were thriving. We were doing good. We we had a revival in 2017, and that was carried us over our church you know doubled almost tripled in that time wow. uh and so god is really blessing and doing a great thing uh that was right before covid hit when during the covid thing we were watching and trying to make the best assessment of what was going on we tried drive in and that didn't work uh you know we, we started to segregate our people because you know people weren't taking public transportation so you literally saw the church go from 100 to you know 25 30 and that was really frustrating uh And I said, you know, I've been out to these big box retailers and I've seen these stores and they're not practicing social distancing. Mm -hmm. They're not being clean. They're not uh, doing all these things. And I said, you know what? Not only can I be social distanced, not only can I be safe, but I can be sanitized. I can do it better than they are Uh, because I watched them and I said, we we can do this. And if they're open, why can't a church be open? Mm -hmm. And so I, I politely wrote a letter to the governor, to the city manager, to the mayor, to the chief of police and said, I'm having church. Uh, And here's why. And uh, that was on a, they got the letter on a Friday, certified mail. All three received it on a Friday. Saturday, nothing. Sunday, we had church. And it was a great, great church. We had about 75 people in church. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, Monday, and you took all the precautions, like you said. Uh, the, the, all the precautions. Right? Every, temperature every, checks, every, the whole shooting yeah. match. Everybody had face masks. Everybody had temperature checks. You know, for the first couple of weeks, they were telling us it could spread on contact. So, you know, my wife and I and, and everybody that came to church was wearing gloves. Uh, and so we we went above and beyond what anybody else was doing so that we could have church. Uh, we we looked foolish, but we were worshiping God uh, because I was I was making a stand. Uh, the following Monday, I got a I got a letter from the chief of police stopped by my house and he said, uh, you know, I just want to give you the governor's order. And I said, I've already read the governor's order. I just want you to know what I'm going to do, chief. I'm going to have church on Wednesday. I'm going to have church on Sunday. I'm going to have church on Wednesday and have church on Sunday. I'm going to keep going. And he just shook his head and walked away. Um, so we had church on Wednesday, the police showed up, they were outside, they were counting people to go in, uh, Sunday, uh, we only had 10 on, on Wednesday cause I think people are still trying to figure out what was going on. Right. Uh, and then on Sunday we ended up having the following Sunday we had church and we had, you know, 75, 85 people in church. Uh, and the chief was outside. Uh, he brought the mounted police. He brought six cop cars up the street, six cop cars down the street, and then four undercover cop cars. And then multiple officers all around the church counting the people as they walked in the building. Um, I was, I thought, wow, this is a very honorable thing to send the mounted police to church on Sunday for the Lord. This is amazing. I don't know if anybody, any church service has ever had this before. So I was thankful that he did that. Yeah, right. um, but there was a woman who came, and she came from Lexington, which is about an hour from where we are. Uh-huh. And she said, I'm coming to your church with my family because you're the only pastor in the state that's willing to take a stand against tyranny. And I want you to know something. When this is all over, you're going to have a completely different church. And, you know, when you're fighting the battle every day against right. the government, hmm. you know, sometimes things slip your mind and you don't really pay attention to them. But when, they're, when you're a month or two after, you start to look back and you're like, you know what? I do have a completely different church. You know, uh, God is, in a sense, has... Um, whittled away some of the people who really didn't have a walk with the Lord and didn't really want to do anything for the Lord. But God has brought in an army of believers who are excited to see what's going on and want someone who's willing to stand up and fight uh, the injustices in this world in a biblical way. You know, my goal is not to, you know, 
to be mean to anybody or hurt anybody, but my goal is to present the love of Jesus Christ um, and teach people the gospel. And you know, the scripture tells us uh, that people are dying for the lack of knowledge. Uh, they don't they don't have it. They don't understand it. And because of that, um, they, they perish in their ignorance. They perish because they don't understand the truth of the Bible. And so having this great opportunity to stand up and, and as you said a little bit early in the interview, to be a freedom fighter, you know, uh, like you said, back in February, I was literally in Florida at a beach house and having the time of my life with my family. And they started shutting down, you know, states. And I just told my wife, I'm like, you know, they're going to shut down Massachusetts. Why don't we just stay here in Zoom meeting from the beach house? You know, we can have a great time. And, and, and you know, uh, if they're going to shut the church down, you know, let them shut it down. I'll have a good time. Um, you know, of course, that was in the flesh. You know, the spirit, uh, my wife had a good spirit. She said, you know, if they're going to shut your city down, you should be there. Uh, you know, and, and here's the truth. I didn't want to be there. I, I wanted to be in Florida and join the sunshine and, right. and not have to snow blow the sidewalks anymore. <laughs> um, but I made the decision, you know, to my wife said, well, I'm not going to tell you what you do. Just think about it. Pray about it tonight. Well, you know, whenever the wife says pray about it, you know, <laughs> the next morning you're going to wake up convicted and you got to make a make change. <laughs> and so I woke up and, uh, and I said, all right, we're on our way home. And so this was a Friday, Friday, we, no, it's a Thursday, we left Florida, and uh, we made it, we, we stopped uh, in D.C., and mm -hmm. I said, you know, uh, if we can make it home in good time, uh, I'll be happy. You know, it typically takes anywhere from uh, 8 to 10 hours to get from Washington, D.C. to Worcester. Uh, we made it home in five and a half hours. Wow. There was no traffic on the road, and I felt like Moses in the Red Sea. God's like, I want you to go home. You're going to do something great. Uh, at the time, I didn't know what God was going to do, but he wanted me to do something. And so we made that trip home, and, and God literally flipped the church upside down in these last 90 days. Uh, and it's been a truly amazing sight, humbling sight to watch what God has done. The, the, the city actually filed a complaint against you, didn't they? They threatened you? Say that again. The, the city actually filed a complaint yeah. against you, didn't they? Or they threatened you? Uh, we're gonna. We, we we might send you to jail. I, what, what, yeah. tell, educate our. What was the response? Your response, Pastor Chris, to that? Yeah, I, I, I thought that was quite hilarious because clearly they didn't do their research. <laughs> um, you know, the the, fir the first time they they sent me a fine. Uh, I just I, I looked at it and I said I can't believe I'm getting fined for having church. So what is America coming to? <laughs> uh, and then. The next time we had church, uh, I was waiting all day for the chief to show up and give me the fine like he did the first time. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't. And so I waited and I waited. And then I watched the city meeting that night. And uh, and the city manager came out and said, you know, we, we were in court all day trying to figure out what we were going to charge Pastor Casey with. And the moment he said we were going to we had to figure out what we were going to yeah, charge right. him with. Yeah. God said, you're going to win. And so they said we filed a, a criminal complaint against him, which carries up to a year in jail in a, in a $500 fine. And so that was a Thursday. Friday, I still haven't got credit for what I'm about to tell you to do, uh, what I did. But Friday, uh, I sent $500 of subs to the police department uh, from Pastor Casey and Adam Square Baptist Church <laughs> to, to, to the chief of police. Uh, I still haven't gotten a thank you for that, uh, oh. but they, they did enjoy the subs. <laughs> and, and, and so, so when they, they, when they, so when when they threatened they, you about going to jail, your response was what? <laughs> Yeah, when they, when they threatened me going to jail, uh, I did a news interview, and they, they asked me the same question. I said, well, clearly they haven't done their research because I spent two years in prison, and that's where I got saved. And you could have just seen the news reporter's chin just dropping. I said, so what are they going to do? They're going to arrest me and put me in jail for the weekend? Praise God. You know, now I can have a prison ministry. Uh, and so, you know, it's prison doesn't – once you've, once you've conquered something, yeah. once, you've, it, once you've defeated it, it right. no longer scares you. So what are you going to threaten me with? jail i've already been there you know i uh, i'm a winner uh, you know we're, we're gonna win so what do you you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna defeat god pastor chris so where does this stand now where where, where is your situation right now so back in uh back in may uh the city decided to drop all charges oh. uh, we filed a federal lawsuit on a on a wednesday at 5 p.m uh by monday morning the governor came out and said uh, churches, in a sense, were essential. And they literally took our cleanliness playbook that we had put in the media that told them what we were doing, 
and they made that a staple for all of Massachusetts. Of course, you got um, credit for that, right? <laughs> no, I didn't get it. No, I didn't get any credit for that either. Yeah, that's how they work. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then Tuesday, the governor of Rhode Island followed suit with the governor of Massachusetts huh. and opened up uh, and opened up churches all across Rhode Island. And so, the the amazing thing is, is that those two states, uh, uh, these two states, are now allowed, you know, not allowed, but now have uh, the option to have church, not not have their religious rights trampled upon. When you opened your church, have you had of your parishioners? Have any of them contracted? COVID? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Now, we see what's happening in California. Uh, similar situation right now that was happening in New Hampshire. They're threatening uh, a number of pastors right now for um, this, even speaking about opening their churches. Have you had any communication with them? Because it appears what you did has been effective. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I saw John MacArthur come out a couple of days ago on Sunday mm -hmm. and put out his, his speech that uh, a couple months ago he was very cautious because they didn't we didn't know anything about COVID. Uh, but now it seems like we know more about it and they're just trying to inflict uh, damage against our First Amendment right. Uh, and so he came out and said, you know, we're going to have church. And uh, and, I, and I just I, I posted online. I said, welcome to the club. Uh, it's good to finally have you having church again. Um, you know, we've never talked, we've never met, but you know, I, I, I stood up first and foremost because that's what God told me to do. That's what he wanted me to do. I had no idea the ramifications that were going to uh, happen. I had no idea the ripple effect that was going to happen. You know, my good friends down in New Jersey had a federal court case yesterday because they followed suit. Uh, they opened church and defied the governor's order. Uh, in the state of New Jersey, it's a, it's a class four felony. Uh, facing a thousand dollar fine every time you do it and jail time for having church. And so, uh, you know, this is a, a scary time in America where people are being fined to go to church, but they can go to the abortion clinic, they can go to the liquor store, they can go to the pot shop, they can, they can fix their home from Home Depot, they can go shopping at Walmart, but you can't go to church. Uh, and so this is a scary time. So we're, we're at, we're at a, a point in American history, uh, 400 years after it was you know, discovered in 1620. We're at a point in America where we're either going to see our, our, ourselves uh, implode in total ruin, or maybe God will give us one more chance and we'll see a great spiritual revival sweep across this nation. And people will turn to God for the first time, and people will turn back to God for being casual and complacent with their walk with the Lord. Pastor Chris, uh, many people that are watching our interview right now um are not allowed to worship. They're not allowed to go to their church. Uh, how should they approach their pastor? What, what should they say to their pastor? That Because many of our viewers, our listeners are frustrated. They feel as though their pastors are just um, sit, sitting on the bench on this one. Yeah. And that's a, that's a very, very, that's a very tough thing because uh, like I said in the in the earlier part of this interview, we have people coming from all over Massachusetts an hour, hour and a half to come to church because we were the only one willing to take a stand. Uh, and, and we had people come and say, why will my pastor not stand up? Why will he not take a stand for the Lord? Don't they know that this is going towards the end times? We need a leader. We don't need a follower. Um, and so I would I would tell you, your, you know, the, the, the listeners and the viewers that, uh, number one, you need to pray. Pray that their pastor, uh, if he doesn't have a backbone, would get a backbone. It would actually stand up and do the right thing. It's our First Amendment right. And uh, here's the problem. If, if pastors continue to do this, this time we had a lot of persecution. Next time they know the pastors didn't stand and they folded, and the next time it's only going to get worse. And so, you know, we should have a, a, all of a sudden we should have one big day where we all stand up and everybody opens their doors and says, you know what, I don't care about the consequences. We're just going to have church and we're going to come back and do what God wants us to do. So number one, pray. But number two, go talk to your pastor. If enough people go to the pastor and say we need to have church, you know, he should, if he's got a backbone, he's going to be convicted about it and, and do it. Now, I understand that, you know, different pastors are in different locations and they have different reasons for why they're doing something and why they're not doing something. But People are looking for a leader, 
you know, I'm, I'm baptizing uh, about eight people, six or eight people this Sunday. I just had an opportunity to lead two more people to the Lord yesterday. Uh, and they said, the only reason we came is because you opened the doors when nobody else did. And we were looking for a man who was going to be a leader. And so there's people out there who are looking for a pastor to be a leader, to lead with authority, to lead with kindness, but to lead with passion. And who's, who's not going to be a sissy, who's not going to back down, who's willing to lay his life down uh, for the sheep, just like Jesus did. Pastor Chris, how can folks follow you? How can they follow your efforts? Uh, do you have an online service that they can tune into? What's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? Yeah, they can go to our website. It's adamsquarebaptist.com, adamsquarebaptist.com. And check out our website. Uh, you know, we, we update it every, uh, every service. Is, it's updated, and we have a constant... Uh, you know, sometimes there's blogs on there, missionary updates, but that's how people stay in touch with us. Or they can visit us on YouTube and, and watch our live stream services. And and what channel is is it Adam Square Baptist channel on YouTube? I'm sorry, it froze again. Is the is your YouTube channel it Adam froze, Square Baptist? Is your is yes, your YouTube, YouTube uh, channel is Adam Square? Yeah, our YouTube channel is Adam Square Baptist Church. Pastor Chris Casey, I'd like to thank you for everything you have done, are doing, and will do. You're an incredible, an incredibly gifted, not only pastor, not only author, not only man, father, husband, but an incredibly freedom fighter. And I thank you for your perseverance and your sacrifice. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you giving this opportunity. I hope you have a blessed day. And same to you, Pastor Chris. And I'd like to thank you folks for joining us. Until next time, Dave Janda signing off. Dream big and dare to fail. Dare to fail. Dare to fail. Dare to fail. Dare to fail.